Welcome to week six of Life Together. Today, we're talking about multiplication. Have you ever had this happen to you where you experienced something for the first time and you just had to tell someone about it? Maybe it's a restaurant where the food is just incredible, a new TV show or movie that you can't wait to watch again, a new band or musician that you just can't get enough of and you need the people in your life to know about it. Several years ago, my wife and I were living in Indiana and while we were there, Portillo's announced that they were going to open a new restaurant in our town, literally five minutes away from our apartment. Now, I grew up in the Chicago suburbs, and Portillo's was, and still is, one of my favorite places in the world. And so it's hard to describe my level of excitement when I heard this news. For months, I would tell anyone who would listen to me what good news this was, how lucky we were for this to happen. And you've got to try the Italian beef, and you have a hot dog, and the cheese fries, and the cake shake. And when it finally opened, I convinced about half the people in our church to meet there for lunch after service one day. I think they agreed just to get me to stop talking about it. But this is what we do, isn't it? When we experience something that at some level has impacted our lives. And this is what we're going to be talking about today as we dive into what it means for a group to grow and multiply. Listen to Paul's words that we see in the book of Romans in chapter 15. He says, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Now, did you notice that? That, that this is Paul's desire for the church. That first, we would, we would live in harmony with each other. That in our horizontal relationships with each other, that we would live not just for ourselves, but with the good of other people in mind. This is what we spent the first two weeks of this series talking about, that life together means living in community, offering encouragement and accountability, bearing each other's burdens, and fulfilling the law of Christ. But we don't just live for each other, we also live for God. That we might glorify God, as Paul puts here, that the Christian life is not just about the horizontal, but the vertical. About growing in our knowledge and love of God through reading the scripture and time spent in prayer. But there's one more aspect. Look again we, with me to verse 7. It says, Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. So there's our horizontal relationships from one person to another. There's our vertical relationships between myself and God. And then our, there's our outward relationships as we seek to invite other people to experience what we are a part of. As we see ourselves not just as consumers, but as cultivators of this community that we are in. We see this modeled, of course, in the life and the ministry of Jesus, how throughout the Gospels, Jesus begins with a simple invitation to come and see, to eat with me, to follow me, to simply explore the kind of kingdom-oriented life that he came to usher in. But then what we see is this progression from following to participating. Jesus inviting the disciples to not just learn from him, but to do what he did. Sending the disciples out in Luke chapter 9 to preach and to heal. It's this graduation almost from observer to participant. And then at the end of Matthew, we see these famous words, this great commission that he gives to the church. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And this is the progression that we see as absolutely essential to the growth and health of our church, that we would be people that aren't just observers or consumers, but participants, partners, that you would see part of your mission as inviting others into this opportunity to grow as a disciple of Jesus. The truth is, is that there are hundreds of people who call Chapel Street Church their home who are looking for the friendship and the community, the accountability, and the deeper life with God that we believe comes best surrounded by other people. What you have begun experiencing with the people in your group. And we need you to see yourselves not as an enclosed circle, not as the lunch table at school where no one else is invited, but rather to consider who it is that you might be able to welcome as Christ has welcomed you. So today, let me give you just three things to think about and consider as we ask what it means to be a group that multiplies. First, to consider the importance and place of hospitality in your own life and in your life together. 
One of the things that you notice when you read about the early church is that this is something that they got absolutely right. They valued and became known for their love of people that were on the outside of their communities. In fact, we see this command in 1 Peter chapter 4. He says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Hospitality, for many in our world today, is somewhat of a lost art. For my fellow introverts, it's often the last thing we want to do, isn't it? After spending a day in the office or with our kids or whatever your work looks like. And yet the author of Hebrews tells us that in our hospitality, we serve the angels themselves. That God is honored when we open our homes and our lives to someone who isn't already in our circle. And this is our desire for what our groups would do as well, that you would be full of hospitality to one another, that your homes and your arms would be open to people that you might not even know yet, that you would make it as easy as possible for someone to walk into your next meeting and feel welcomed, comfortable, and at home. Second, consider the significance of a personal invitation. In my role as groups pastor, there are two things that I have noticed to be generally true. First, that the chances of a group experiencing long-term and consistent growth goes dramatically up when new people are added. That there's a temptation for groups to fall into apathy or even stagnation when a group stays the same for too long. And second, that it is hard for a new person to join an existing group, but considerably easier when they have received a personal invitation rather than being matched up by someone like me. If there's a friend, a neighbor, someone in your life that you think could use a community like yours, the reality is is they are much more likely to say yes to you than they are to me. And third, consider the call of leadership in your own life as well. The most successful groups, the ones that experience authentic community, deeper faith, that are on mission together, don't wait for the leaders to do it all themselves. Healthy group members share leadership, Plan social events, lead discussions, pray for one another, and consider what it could mean for me to take what I have experienced it and bring it somewhere new. Think back to Jesus' words in Matthew, to go and make disciples of all nations. Imagine for just a moment if he told them, stay where you are, build community amongst yourself, just encourage and pray for each other and nobody else. If that's what he said, none of us would be doing what we are right now, and yet this is the nature of the gospel. That when we experience something that impacts us, a great song, a hit show, a good meal, or the good news, a life of friendship and joy and forgiveness and prayer, it is the nature of good news to spread. Let us be people who do so. Let us grow, multiply, and share this life together.